our minds extend far beyond our brains through fields. So there's reality, but there's the way reality appears to you. Perhaps we make sense of the world because the world is mind-like or even internal to our minds. Experience is basically what it's like to have a mind. Think about who is it, what is it that's making sense of the world? These little pinprick bonces, otherwise known as our head, appear to have true things to say about universe. Now let's look, it's a rather unequal contest. Our heads have a volume of about four liters, ish. The universe is four times 10 to the power 23 cubic light years. So it seems a fairly unequal contest when one is trying to understand the other. The most famous attempt to explain our capacity to understand the world comes from Kant's, Immanuel Kant's critique of pure reason. The opposite view is that biology shaped the mind to make sense of the world, naturalism. His argument is the mind imposes the spatio-temporal structure of the experienced world. The world is like it is because it has the categories of, uh, or the, the forms of sensible intuition, as he called it, imposed on the world. So it is the mind that brings the chaos of experience to order by imposing the categories of understanding such as things like causation and so on. So we might say, well, if we impose these things on the world, what about the world in itself? He says, the reality of the world beyond experience is unknown to us. So the world makes sense to us because in some fundamental sense, we impose sense on the world. Now, the alternative is that the mind conforms to nature because it better bloody had to. That is to say, we have to get things right Otherwise, we would not have survived. The very fact that I'm up here talking to you indicates that I'm a survivor who somehow must have got the world right, because if I didn't get the world right, I um, wouldn't be around. We wouldn't survive. The mind, is the, so the argument goes, is really the brain, and the brain is an evolved organ that's necessary for the kind of evolutionary success that's <coughs> produced its finest product, like me. So, biology shaped the mind to make sense of the world. That's the naturalistic viewpoint. One of the extraordinary things about our capacity to understand the world is that we escape our subjectivity. The ultimate aim of science is the so-called view from nowhere. And the, close to the view from nowhere is something like E equals mc squared. And E equals mc squared, as, as it were, has escaped from subjective perspective. It's escaped from my viewpoint, your viewpoint. It's escaped uh, from frames of reference, etc., etc. It is an, an eternal truth. It, it's not, uh, it is one of those truths that is not in any sense uh, person dependent. And that brings us to the mystery of the nature of objective knowledge. How is it that we arrive at objective knowledge? Knowledge that doesn't belong to you or to me, unlike our perceptions, unlike our sensations. My pain is my pain, but the theory of pain belongs to any of us. The trouble with that is that it leaves a kind of senselessness at the heart of sense, and I'll mention that in due course. And finally, the question we want to ask is, supposing we wanted to think about understanding the world, how do we have any sense of progress? Is the world such that we could have a complete understanding of it? Well, what would a under complete understanding be? Well, let's think about vision. Supposing I could see all of the world, in order to see all of the world, I'd have to see through everything to see everything else. So a totally comprehended world would actually have no content. It would just be invisible, just like a totally visible world would be invisible. Knowledge, of course, is ultimately based on experience. If I know that London is 200 miles from Stockport, that knowledge ultimately can be tested against experience. But knowledge transcends experience. Again, it's not something like a pain or whatever that, I, um, that belongs to me. Knowing that something is the case is quite different from experiencing something. And this brings us to a mystery. And you may think there's facts about the, boring, the most boring things there are. There's nothing matter of fact about facts. The fact that we know that something is the case, you know it. I know it, we can share it between us, is one of those things that is absolutely unique to humanity.
the sky, when you look at it, is inside your head. Your skull's beyond the sky. This is just a virtual skull created as a perceptual illusion. Uh, all your experience is inside your head. That is the conventional orthodox point of view when you think it through. Of course, when you think it through, it seems absurd. But that is, nevertheless, what's being taught in all our universities and philosophy departments. Most philosophers are materialists, and almost all uh, brain sciences and neuroscience are based on the materialist model. Well, it's very counterintuitive to believe that. It's not at all common sense. And I'd like to suggest an alternative theory of vision, which is so simple it's hard to grasp. And that is that your image of me isn't inside your head, it's right here, exactly where it seems to be. Um, it's not inside your head, it's in your mind, but not inside your brain. So I'm suggesting vision involves a two-way process, the inward movement of light and the outward projection of images. Your images are projected out to where they seem to be. If you look at a distant star, um, your mind stretches out over literally astronomical distances and intriguingly moves years back in time because that light's taken years to get here um, and uh, to contact that star. When I look at you, uh, my mind reaches out to touch you. My image of you is projected to where you are. Sometimes we project images to where things aren't and that's an illusion or a hallucination. Fortunately, they're rare. If they were more common, none of us would have got here this evening. Uh, we would be bumping into things and we'd be quite un incapable of living in the world. So, um, most of the time we pre project out a perceptual world and this vision uh, involves an inward movement of light, changes in the brain and then this outward projection of images. Now, this is not an original theory of vision. I claim no uh, priority for this. It's what most people throughout the world have always believed. It's what Plato believed um, in his theory of vision. It's what the great Greek geometer Euclid believed. And it was Euclid who thought in terms of the projections coming out of the eyes, who was the first person to give a clear explanation of mirror images. Euclid pointed out that when light comes off a mirror, the light's reflected by the mirror. But the light comes into your eyes, you project out the images but because those projections are mental, not physical, uh, they go through the mirror and produce virtual images behind the mirror, which is why you see these virtual images in mirrors. They're your outward projections just going straight through the mirror. Um, it, it's a theory still taught in textbooks today. It was a, a brilliant explanation of mirror images. Now, I'm a scientist, not a philosopher. And so uh, if this is true, it should be testable experimentally. Is it? If I'm, what I'm saying is right, just by looking at something, you may be able to affect what you're looking at because your mind reaches out to touch it. And I think it reaches out through what I call perceptual fields. These are fields of perception. Our minds reach out through fields. All our visual world now is in fields projected by our minds coming out of our eyes. If I looked at you from behind and you didn't know I was there and you couldn't hear me, I, maybe I looked through a window so you can't, there's no sound, there's no smell, I'm just looking at you from behind, could you tell you were being looked at from behind? Now as soon as you ask that question you realize it's a common experience. <coughs> Most people have had the experience of being looked at from behind. Surveys show that the great majority of people have had this experience in fact. There's a slight sex difference. More women than men have experienced being stared at, and more men than women have experienced staring at others and making them turn around. Um, <laughs> but both men and women have experienced this in the passive and the active mode. Most men and women, over 90%, and surveys show that over 90% of children are, are well aware of this too. I've given talks on this in primary schools to eight and nine-year-olds, and uh, when I ask the question, almost every hand goes up. Yes, I've had that, and they start telling these stories. They're very aware of it. So these things are very well known. Now, do they really happen? Uh, in spite, you know, many of my scientific colleagues would say, of course not, it's impossible. The mind's inside the head. They can't really happen. It's all just superstition. It's just credulity. Ordinary people uh, are just don't know. They haven't been educated about vision. Um, and indeed, in scientific journals, in the last hundred years, to between 1890 and 1985, there were only four published papers on this phenomenon in the scientific literature. It's a totally taboo topic. 
because it ought not to happen. The brain is a prediction machine. And that everything that we perceive, everything that we experience, everything that we do is a kind of brain-based prediction. Now just think about what it means to be a brain for a minute. And let's take perception as this task of figuring out what's out there in the world. There you are, you're your brain, you're locked inside this bony skull. It's dark in there, it's silent. All you've got to go on as a brain are streams of electrical signals which are only indirectly related to things in the world, whatever they may be. And from these noisy, ambiguous, uncertain electrical signals, the brain conjures forth a world full of things with positions and, and properties. How does it do that? The idea, and this is an idea that goes way back in science and in philosophy, is that it's a process of inference of some kind. So by inference, I just mean the brain is making its best guess about what's out there based on inherently uncertain, noisy, ambiguous data. The brain is combining its expectations, expectations that you're not personally aware of having that can be built deep into the circuitry of the brain, like that light comes from above. Expectations combines those with sensory data, and then what you perceive, this is the hypothesis, is the content of the brain's predictions. It's not a readout of the sensory data. In neuroscience, there's this idea of predictive processing or predictive coding as a way of how this might actually happen in the brain. And the idea is simply this, that the brain is continually generating predictions about the causes of its sensory signals. Like, is it, you know, is it an object? Is it what color is it? Is it round? Is it rectangular? All these predictions about, you know, at various levels of description, is the color stopping here or is it a part of a bigger object? All sorts of things. And sensory data that comes in is, is just calibrating these predictions. It's updating them. It's serving as prediction error. So our brains perceptual content comes from the inside out and is just reined in by sensory data. This is quite an inversion of how we might typically think of it. It's very intuitive to think of perception as a process of reading out what's already there in the information that comes into our senses. This is very different. It's saying that perceptual content essentially comes from within. It's always a construction, but it's calibrated. It's geared to the world. It's tied to the world in useful ways and it's critically not by a criterion of accuracy, the brain doesn't care whether it's accurately or exhaustively capturing reality. It's just if it's useful. You know, we see colors, we experience colors, not because colors exist, but because perceiving colors is a very useful way for the brain to guide behavior. And this is a, this is a radical shift, that, 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 and it's not my idea at all. It's, it goes back to Helmholtz and Kant in some ways, that perception comes in this from the inside out. And so what we're doing in my lab, one of the things we're doing, and I'll go quickly through this, is trying to put these, these ideas to the test a little bit. It's one thing to say this, but does it actually make sense in terms of the data? Well, one thing that it actually already makes sense of is we know in the brain there are many more connections that go in this inside-out direction than in the outside-in direction. Uh, this is kind of mysterious if you think that uh, perception is done more in the, the outside-in direction. So it makes sense from that perspective. We've also done a bunch of experiments trying to see whether the brain's expectations actually do shape uh, what we experience. So some of these experiments are very simple. We just lead people to do things like expect to, to see a particular kind of image. We, ex we cue them to expect to see a house or a face, and then we show these houses and faces in various uh, deliberately ambiguous situations, and we ask, how do these expectations affect conscious perception? And what we find is that when people are expecting to see a face, they see that face consciously more quickly and more accurately than if it's unexpected. This is interesting. In a sense, it's like people are used to saying that, you know, I'll believe it when I see it, but actually it's the other way around, that you'll see it if you believe it. The mind, the English word the mind, does not have an exact equivalent in contemporary German. In 18th century German, there was something which worked almost like the English term the mind, gemüt, but no one uses this anymore, and it also doesn't mean the mind anymore to the extent to which you would even use it. So the mind is not an obviously referring term. It's not like obviously we know what the mind is, and the question is what its relation is its relation to the brain. We don't even know exactly what the mind is, apart from 
meaning ascriptions to the term that in particular philosophers have offered. So the term the mind, I think, is an artifact of uh, English-speaking philosophy and a misguided one on top of that because it's um, <coughs> a consequence of trying to make sense of nonsense. Okay, it's part of a long nonsense poem, uh, the mind. So I, I never really understood what that is. Yeah. There's a better term in German, so now I'm playing the German philosopher, and, uh, 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 but, uh, uh, but now I'm giving sense to it. Okay? So the, b the better word is Geist, uh, uh, and a way of translating this is roughly human-mindedness. So here's how this works. Okay. So humans are in the peculiar situation, and we are all in this situation right now together and in a self-conscious way, in the peculiar situation of wondering how we blend in with non-human reality. So we know there's non-human reality, at least I don't doubt it, and non-human reality includes, you know, like uh, galaxies and uh, forces. Uh, I happen to think it includes numbers, but be that as it may, whatever is part of non-human reality, something is, right? Now, here's my definition now of human-mindedness. Human-mindedness is the capacity to lead a life in light of your answer to the question how you blend in. Okay, so human-mindedness is the capacity to lead a life in light of your answer to the question how you blend in. Now, this, let me give you uh, uh, examples of this. So imagine you believe you have an immortal soul. Uh, then you will do certain things. So imagine you have an immortal soul and you think God is constantly observing you. So if you think you have an immortal soul and your thoughts are, you know, are tested by God, are they good thoughts, right? Does he want to eat sausage? Does he want to have sex and so forth? And, and you're constantly trying to hide your thoughts, but it doesn't quite work. And so, so you'll act in a certain way. All I'm saying is that if you think, okay, your way to blend in is to have an immortal soul in a divine plan, then you'll act in a certain way. Now let's imagine an extreme denier of this. Let's call this fictitious person Richard Dawkins, okay? <laughs> so now you have someone who says, no, absolutely no to that, right? I am just a sophisticated killer ape trying to spread his genes. So a good way to do this is become professor of biology at Oxford and write popular <laughs> books, which will hopefully, hopefully attract some uh, mating partners. <laughs> so, uh, um, so if that's what you believe, right? then you'll act in different ways. I don't want to spell out what this uh, entails <laughs> and what the best way then of you know, carrying out your plan would be. But you see, you'll do different things. Yeah? Now, the important fact about human-mindedness is the following. Regardless of the truth or falsity of your account of how you blend in, you will become different. You can change the way you are by having false beliefs about yourself. If I have a true belief about myself, I also change, I might become enlightened. Huh? Now that case differs substantially from the case of, say, the mass of overall mass of fermions in the known universe. Regardless of my true or false belief about it, they are just facts of the matter, and they don't change in virtue of my false beliefs about them. Okay? So I clearly have false beliefs about fermions. I'm not a physicist. I know some things about fermions. If you push me a little bit, you'll notice that I clearly have some false beliefs about them. Actually, everyone has false beliefs about fermions because we haven't fully figured them out. But be that as it may, okay, my false beliefs about them don't change them. The human mind is precisely this. Living a life in light of your conception of who or what you are. You were talking about experience as subjective and conscious. Does that suggest or not that there can still be things that are mysterious in it? Can you, have a, can you be fully conscious of something which remains mysterious? Yeah, well, I think in some sense, consciousness, experience, is the thing which we know more directly than we know anything in the world. I certainly seem to have very direct and immediate knowledge of my experience, my visual experience right now, a feeling of pain and so on, but still at the level of understanding and explanation, I think it's extremely mysterious. So I would, uh, I, mean, I would prefer to raise these questions in the key of explanation. I mean, I agree with Peter that if you ask the question, is experiencing part of the material world, it's at the very 
least ambiguous and unclear uh, what the content of that is. For me, the, the real question is how can we explain experience, uh, the experiences we have and the fact that we're experiencing now, and in particular, if you're going to raise that in the key of science, can you explain let our me, experiencing uh, in physical terms? Let me stop you right on that. You said what you're experiencing now. What are you experiencing now? Many things. I'm experiencing a, a certain feeling in the, in the bottom of my, of my foot, and my bum on the, on the seat. I'm experiencing, um, I'm seeing you right now. I'm having a visual experience of you and of the, the floor and of my hand. I'm hearing the sound of my own voice droning on and on. And what's the, what's the problem with any of that, if any? Why is there any such thing? Why is there any experience? How, and in particular, can any of that be explained in wholly physical terms? The natural place to look is in terms of my brain. There's a whole bunch of processes in my brain, and you can tell quite a lot, for example, about the process whereby the eye sends signals to the visual cortex, which sends signals throughout the brain. But does any of that explain why it is that I'm, in fact, visually experiencing, that there's a certain subjective quality from the first right. person? So you can say that it's the case, you can't say why it's the case. That's right, yeah. Um, at least certain kinds of explanation, those in terms of neuroscience, for example, seem at least to be, those wholly in terms of neuroscience seem to be incomplete. That leaves open whether there are other explanations. Maybe there are historical or psychological explanations. I'm experiencing this because I looked over there and, uh, and there you were, and of course I saw you, but that's kind of presupposing that I have the capacity for experience. The very fact of it in the first place is not explained. And let's pick up on this notion that, uh, you know, uh, uh, the explanations of neuroscience are incomplete, because it clearly goes back to what you were saying earlier, Susanna. And I, I think what you were saying is, well, yes, the explanations of neuroscience might be incomplete right now, because neuroscience has a bit further to go. But in principle, neuroscience could explain everything. And that would be, is that something you would s continue to disagree with, even if Susanna and her discipline were to evolve to a point where neuroscience could no longer be perfected anymore, would it be for you the case, David, that you'd say that's still an insufficient explanation? We cannot, we cannot explain all of experience in neuroscientific terms. I'm actually, I'm a big fan of neuroscience. I'm a big fan of the neuroscience of consciousness, which Susanna has contributed a lot to. But I think at least at the moment, and maybe in principle, it's got certain limitations which is it's basically a science of correlations. We find out, the, uh, for example, the processes in the brain which are active when someone's having an experience, say, of a certain color or of a certain shape or of a certain going on in their, um, in their visual field. And it's at a level, really, the science, at least recently, has been at a level of correlations. The project has been to look for the neural correlate of consciousness, or the NCC, as some people talk of, which has nice Star Trek overtones for those of you who are Remember the Enterprise, which was NCC 1701, looking for the, uh, the neural correlate of consciousness. We're about, what we want to get to is explanation. And I think my view is that really what we need to do is the neuroscience is always going to, it's great for explaining certain things, behaviors and functional responses, things on the objective side. But to get to the objective side, I think somehow you need to assume some kind of bridging principle that links you from the objective <laughs> to the subjective. And if you do that, and people have got some interesting proposals out there right now, including neuroscientists who have theories that link neuroscience to the subjective, then neuroscience plus such a bridging principle might give you some explanation of consciousness. But neuroscience on its own, I think, is not going to do it. In the context of decision-making and of consciousness, we do have this remarkable thing that we call self-control. And it's often very robust. It's often very non-conscious in its execution. It involves skills that can be technical, social, wide ranging life skills, skills about how to handle your finances, how to handle matters concerning health. It involves such things as maintaining a goal despite distractions or despite other, other impulses. It involves suppressing impulses that are inconsistent with maintaining a goal, delaying gratification. It involves adhering to training. These are all things that we know at a very common sense level. And what we're learning now is that 
uh, maintaining a goal, often you have to be conscious to do it, but the mechanisms whereby it is achieved are largely non-conscious. And so there are many things that uh, we learn as skills. Sometimes we learn them just through experience of having things work out well or having other things work out badly. We also learn through imitation. We learn through approval and disapproval from parents and siblings and teachers. We learn through stories and songs and simply watching others. So I've emphasized that these, these skills are, are important and clever and appropriate, but that in the execution of a well-honed skill, um, there really isn't time for conscious deliberation and for consideration of salience. Sometimes, of course, um, we give in to impulse and uh, sometimes the negative feedback is sufficient that that impulse gets squashed uh, and we don't do it again. The key structures shown here are the ventral tegmental area. And the ventral tegmental area projects to a nucleus not shown here, the nucleus accumbens. And it projects to the nucleus accumbens and um, secretes dopamine. And those neurons then activate neurons in the nucleus accumbens where if the action produced good consequences, uh, endocannabinoids are released it feels pleasurable. So it's not the dopamine per se that feels pleasurable, it's the interaction with the neurons in the nucleus accumbens. And other neurons, if the outcome of the action was negative and painful, other neurons will respond and indicate that uh, this action is not a good action um, to do again. In other words, it will give it negative valuation. And those are neurons that are mostly involved um, with serotonin. So you can see in the case of serotonin, there is widespread projection, not only within cortex, but in these more ancient structures uh, within the, the brainstem. This is not a terribly illuminating um, diagram, but it conveys, this is a, a, a diagram of a, a rat brain, not a, a human brain, but it indicates that in these older structures, there are a lot of interactions between the VTA, the ventral tegmental area, which is the dopamine releasing area, the nucleus accumbens, which releases endocannabinoids and opioids, but many other structures as well. And that's why the skill learning gets more and more and more complex, the more complex uh, the nature of the brain uh, as, as a whole. But it is remarkable that even uh, rats, for example, as well as, as foxes and, and wolves uh, can display really quite impressive self-control. And of course, what we're interested in also is where those mechanisms differ in individuals who really lack self-control and how self-control through behavioral techniques, for example, might be modified so that individuals have more control over their specific impulses. So you've, most people have heard about the hard problem of consciousness, this very deep mystery. One common reaction people have is to say, okay, let's just put the hard problem of consciousness on one side. That's too difficult. What we can do is focus on the quote unquote easier problem of tracking the, the neural correlates of consciousness, the NCC, working out what kinds of brain activity correspond to what kinds of conscious experience. Now, so towards the end of the 1990s, the neuroscientist Christoph Koch, pictured here, had a bet with David Chalmers. He bet him a, a case of fine wine that in 25 years, we would have completely mapped out the neural correlates of consciousness. It looks like he's about to lose that bet because 
you know, it's a mess. We've got lots of different theories, different views about whether consciousness is in the front of the brain or the back of the brain. Very little way of thinking how we can make consensus here. And I think that the problem at the core of this is that consciousness is not publicly observable. You can't look inside somebody's head and see their feelings and experiences. So to do the science, you ha what we have to have is what I call detection procedures. We have to have principles that link observable behavior to conscious, unobservable conscious experience. So here's one of them, the what I call the report principle, that if a subject has an experience, they can report it. So once, if you accept that principle, then we can see how you can do some neuroscience, how you can track the neural correlates, because you want to know if someone's having an experience? Ask them. Trouble is, all these detection procedures are controversial. So some people, many people, like um, Ned Block, for example, accept what's become known as the overflow thesis, that there are experiences that we are unable to attend to. How do you, why would anyone think there are experiences you're unable to attend to? Well, there's, you know, it's quite well established now that there are significant limits on how much we're able to attend to at one time. You know, I can't attend to the details of all of your faces and the sounds outside and the clothes on my body at the same time. So what do you do with that? You go two ways. Some people say, well, I'm not actually experiencing the details of your faces. All I'm really ex consciously experiencing is what I can attend to. Whereas other philosophers say, no, I am actually experiencing all the intricate detail of your faces and the feeling of the clothes on my body and the sounds outside. It's just I'm limited on what I can attend to in my experience. So then you're going to have the result that there are some things you're actually experiencing. It's part of your conscious experience, but you can't attend to it. And then we start to get exceptions to the report principle. And this isn't just an abstract philosophical debate. This leads to very different theories of the neuroscience, the neural correlates of consciousness. So this isn't the hard problem. This was supposed to be the easy problem. So if, like Hakuan Lau pictured here, you accept the report principle, then you're going to tend to locate consciousness in the front of the brain. If you deny it, like Ned Block, you're going to tend to locate it at the back of the brain. Why is that? Because those who accept the report principle, there is a tight connection between something being conscious and it being available for cognition. And the prefrontal cortex, the front of the brain, is, is responsible for cognitive processes, like working memory. So there's just this very deep difficulty about how we do the science. Now, you know, there are ways of responding to this and having kind of indirect arguments, but it essentially becomes philosophy, metaphysics. It's very hard to see how we can do, you know, real experimental science with this. However, so I'm in, I am inclined to accept this strong emergentist view on philosophical grounds. I think it's an open question empirically. We don't know enough about how the brain works to establish it one way or another. But on philosophical grounds, for example, I'm, I can't go into this now, but I'm increasingly skeptical about a kind of reductionist picture of rationality or agency. So I am inclined on philosophical grounds to accept this strong emergentist view that there are new fundamental entities, systems level properties in the brain. If that turns out to be true, uh, then we have a, a possible way forward on this deep difficulty that's been going on for about 150 years. There's a great paper by Matthias Michel arguing how we've been having this dispute over like the rapport principle since the 19th century. Okay, but if strong emergentism is true, then identifying strongly emergent causal dynamics will be a major piece of evidence in establishing the neural correlates of consciousness. If it turns out, for example, that there are strongly emergent dynamics in the back of the brain, but not in the front of the brain, that is to say there are causal dynamics that are not reducible to underlying chemistry or physics, that will be a very strong experimental reason to locate consciousness there. And this isn't just a sort of abstract possibility. Uh, there are people engaged in this. So Martin Picard in the uh, mitochondrial psychobiology lab at Columbia University is exploring experimentally the hypothesis that mitochondria in the brain form social networks. And we should understand their behavior not by reducing it to underlying chemistry, but as kind of irreducible social networks. The neuroscientist Kevin Mitchell, who is not a fan of panpsychism, very hostile to panpsychism, but does believe in some kind of emer strongly emergent dynamics in the brain and is exploring ways of, of modeling them. So these seem to me the most exciting ways forward uh, on, on the science of consciousness. 
Now, I don't think, you know, this doesn't necessarily entail panpsychism. I think, you know, because consciousness is not publicly observable, I don't think you can ever totally pin down a theory of consciousness with experiments. Um, I, so I, I think if, so if it were established, as I tentatively think it will one day be, that there is strong emergence in the brain, that leaves open to philosophical possibilities. For more debates, talks and interviews, subscribe today to the Institute of Art and Ideas at IAI TV.